start um, with a principle and it's the most important thing that I want to leave folks watching this video with. And that is that the right to housing has a substantive legal framework that we have from international human rights law. And it's important to also remember that Canada has signed on to a number of international human rights treaties. Some of these treaties have protected things like the right to civil and political rights, like the right to vote, the right um, for freedom of assembly, freedom of expression. And we've also signed on to covenants that protect civil and or economic and social rights, like the right to food, the right to housing, the right to health. But somewhere along the way, Canada decided to really, really value those civil and political rights within our legal structures and really devalue the right to housing and other economic, social and cultural rights. And um, one of the things about the right to housing is that if you don't have protection for it, if you don't have the way to exercise the right, does it really exist? And so after many, many decades of advocacy, um, folks had been pushing to have some way that they could exercise the right to housing, some way that they could put their hands in it and say, my rights have been violated, tenants' rights have been violated, um, and really shift the balance of power for people experiencing homelessness, tenants, people in precarious housing situations. And so after much, much advocacy, uh, we started together, civil society started gathering what it would look like to legislate the right to housing in Canada. And this followed an announcement around 2000 or 2017, around then when the National Housing Strategy came out and the government of Canada expressed that they were now interested in the right to housing and really digging in and exploring what that meant. And so in 2018, after loads of advocacy, and when I say loads of advocacy, I mean loads of advocacy work and back and forth, in June of 2019, we saw the introduction of the National Housing Strategy Act. Um, this was a really big moment for Canada and a really big moment internationally because before this, um, we hadn't seen this kind of creative, unique way to claim the right to housing. A lot of other countries, a lot of other jurisdictions actually protect the right to housing, say, in their constitutions, or they have other real concrete ways of bringing forward systemic claims related to the right to housing. But in Canada, we didn't have anything like this. We created the NHSA for the National Housing Strategy Act. What is so special about this legislation, about the NHSA, is that one, it cites really explicitly, and this is so important, it cites explicitly that it is the mechanism by which Canada is implementing the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. So what that means is that the NHSA doesn't protect the right to housing just as an idea, it protects the right to housing as it is represented in international human rights law, which means that we can use to we can use that um, use interpretation tools like what United Nations committees are telling us, what United Nations special rapporteurs are telling us, um, what kind of jurisprudence is coming out of uh, processes like the optional protocol. That's how we can interpret what it really, really means to do the right to housing. It also critically created these mechanisms by which people can bring forward systemic claims related to the right to housing. And within that, we ha will have soon, fingers crossed, I hope by the time folks are watching this video, we will have a federal housing advocate. The federal housing advocate is housed at the Canadian Human Rights Commission, and they'll have the opportunity to, um, to investigate systemic claims related to the right to housing, big systemic issues related to the right to housing, things like how do we address the financialization of housing vis-a-vis -vis the, the right to housing? How do we um, address the disproportionate impact of homelessness on particular marginalized groups like youth, like women, like persons of color, Black persons, Indigenous persons? And how do we change our existing laws, policies, and programs through things like the National Housing Strategy and make them really, truly rights-based and, and mirror progressive realization and a maximum of available resources? So they'll be able to investigate systemic claims. They'll be able to make recommendations that get, then go to the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. And then the minister actually has to respond to those recommendations. Um, they're not binding, they're not legally binding. However, 
they do make it so that the minister has to respond as to whether or not they will be implementing those recommendations. The advocate will also have the opportunity to refer those systemic claims to a review panel. The review panel is made up of three members of the National Housing Council, and in particular, three members who have technical right to housing expertise, as well as lived experience of homelessness or inadequate housing. And that review panel will be able to hold open public hearings related to those systemic claims. And they'll again be making recommendations that go to the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development that uh, the minister then has to respond again within 120 days. But what's really cool um, is that that response has to be tabled at the House of Commons and the Senate. So what we have here is this new, exciting, innovative way that we can bring forward the really big systemic claims and we can look at accountability, accountability primarily of the federal government to truly end homelessness, to realize the right to housing for youth and other particular populations, as well as the larger experience of the housing crisis within Canada. And we have a way to, to push and balance power again through this really um, innovative and exciting mechanism. Of course, what's really important is for this to work, we needed systemic claims to come forward. We need to be well mobilized as civil society with adequate research behind those systemic claims and have some ideas of what the remedies or um, recommendations are to address those systemic claims. We also have to make sure that the council and the federal housing advocate and the review panel are well constructed, are built with, um, with the right to housing in mind and really embrace those international human rights, jurisprudence and authorities that I spoke about earlier that we know have come from the UN. Um, First, there is the question of the right to housing as it applies to a young person, perhaps in the way that they might face discrimination and principles of, of non-equality. Um, so, for example, when a young person is attempting to find a place in a shelter and they're denied because of their, um, of their uh, sexual orientation or their gender identity, um, there are those forms of discrimination that have huge implications for the right to housing, right? That's more the provincial protection around the right to housing. But, um, you know, really interesting. I'll sh interestingly, I will share that um, in some of the work that I have been doing uh, along with colleagues um, and other members of the National Right to Housing Network, this issue of discrimination and housing and the ways that people, particularly in marginalized communities, are facing discrimination, that, in, that it is actually protected most of the time by provincial or territorial human rights codes, um, how much people are still facing barriers to accessing shelter, to um, accessing Landlord support, they're being denied housing because of their age, because of um, because they're on social assistance programs, because of sexual orientation, that kind of those kinds of violations continue to perpetuate our housing systems. There's also, though, this larger piece, and that is what is the obligation of really all levels of government, but in particular for this conversation, let's focus on the federal government and say, what is the obligation of the federal government to ensure, for example, that adequate funding is put towards um, housing for youth experiencing homelessness um, and implementing things like housing first programs or implementing things like shelters or implementing things like transitional housing or other type of housing solutions. Um, what is the federal government's obligation in ensuring there's enough housing stock for young people that there are wraparound services um, and ensuring prevention and thinking about the intersections of for example, the exit of the, through from the child welfare system that often leads directly into homelessness without any programmatic support in between or, or follow through in between. There is this way in which it can apply to individuals, but what's really interesting is it's gonna be up to researchers, to advocates, to legal advocates, and in particular rights claimants themselves to work together and collaborate and bring forward systemic claims. And I think in a lot of ways that there is some discomfort 
in that um, for a lot of advocates. You know, we focus on research and government relations work and, and showing best practices, which is really, really critical. But this role of the advocate and review panel is going to be a brand new way for us to exercise these rights and say, We've done research to say we know what the solutions are, you know, for example, to capture youth who are exiting the child welfare system. We've done this research and we can see how this is impacting rights claimants, work with rights claimants, and put through submissions to the advocate, really shed light and use these mechanisms to say this isn't just a matter of good policy. This is a matter of international human rights law and the right to housing and what we have protected through legislation. It's kind of a new way to think about the way that we drive forward the right to housing, more from this perspective of access to justice and rights that, you know, we should be, we should be more deeply integrated in, though we've taken instead in our legal system, this um, internalization of civil and political rights as being inherently protected. And just, it's about turning our focus to what does it mean to legally protect these rights? And what does it mean how do we come together to bring forward these systemic claims and shed light on what's missing? I will start by saying that one of the issues that we will come up against with the National Housing Strategy Act is a lot of it protects the federal jurisdiction around housing. Um, and while the federal government protects a lot of the spending around housing, and there's a lot of ways I would argue that the federal government gets implicated for housing um, and Canada's housing crisis. A lot of jurisdiction actually falls to the provinces and territories, and in many cases, local communities or municipalities. And the reality is, is that for the right to housing to genuinely be realized, we need mechanisms to exist in provinces and territories and in municipalities. We need a way for the right to housing to live through legislation, through policy, and we need mechanisms like the advocate to exist for people to be able to, an advocate or um, commissioner or ombudsperson to be able to investigate these issues, make recommendations and have genuine responses from the government to these violations of the right to housing. The right to housing it can't just be a concept, right? It is, it is a concept that flows through our work um, in the same way that anti-oppression, equality, non-discrimination can flow through our work and really guide us. But what is so important is to make the right to housing live. Rights claimants and people who have borne the brunt of the housing crisis have to be a way, have to have a way that they can hold it in their hands and exercise it and hold people and in particular governments, but hold people and actors accountable for their actions. Because that's the beauty of rights is it shifts the, the balance of power. It shifts it to rights claimants. It forces us to have conversations that are based in a legitimate international human rights law framework that has instructed us in what this actually has to look like. And so what I will say that's really exciting is across Canada in particular, there's a lot of ways that the right to housing is being explored through provincial or municipal legislation. There's a lot of groups who have explored what it would look like to have legislation, housing policy, something that really legislates and codifies the right to housing and creates that accountability mechanism, that way to investigate the big systemic issues. And when you look at other countries, if you go outside of the Canadian context, there's so many different examples of the way that this has been done and done effectively for many, many decades. You know, when you look at our landscape right now in Canada, across the world, we have um, a growing, deepening issue, I really believe, where private actors, um, in particular real estate investment trusts, but many different private actors, landlords, housing providers, governments, hold all of the power in housing situations. And I would say increasingly, especially with the growing commodification of housing, tenants' rights and um, people experiencing homelessness rights are deflating more and more and more. And it's only through mechanisms that really hold people legally accountable and balance that power that we can have more of an equal playing field and have a way that we're creating housing solutions that address the deep, really difficult 
racist colonial ideas and centralities that are deeply embedded within our existing housing systems. We need the right to housing as a legal mechanism in order to balance that out.